The Holy Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the Father has sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Beloved of God, grace to you and peace from the one who created us, redeemed us, and moves among us still. Amen. A handful of years ago, a woman I'll call Amy came into my life. She had applied to serve with the year-long international service program that I directed and pastored at the time. Amy had a heart for service and a genuine openness to allow herself to be shaped by a community in another part of the world. But this doesn't, wasn't just a program, it was also a congregation, and Amy hadn't grown up in the church. She'd been to Catholic Mass a couple of times with extended family and had attended a Unitarian fellowship once or twice with a friend who identified as spiritual but not religious, and that was about it. I was curious about how she'd ended up connecting with the church program. She explained that she had attended a Lutheran liberal arts college and was intrigued enough by the required theology courses that she decided she'd take a chance and apply. Amy and I had several long conversations over the phone as part of her application process. We talked about the curiosities and doubts that she had about Christianity. We talked about what it would mean for a community in another part of the world to receive her not just as a well-intended volunteer, but as a representative of the church. And we talked about what it would feel like for her to become part of a Christian community with all of her curiosities and doubts in play. We needed to sort out together whether she could with integrity commit to participating fully in the worship life, not just of the congregation that we would create together with the other volunteer missionaries and pastors who made up this program, but in the worship life of whatever international community she might end up in. One of the biggest points of conversation for us was Holy Communion, which Amy had never received before. Over the course of many hours, Amy and I talked about how Lutherans believe Jesus to be truly present in, with, and under the bread and wine that we receive in Holy Communion. We talked about how the communion table belongs to God and not to any person or church and how God's welcome to the table is wider and more expansive than we can imagine or understand. We talked about how communion strengthens our relationship, not with just with Jesus, but with the entire Christian community of every time and place. And we talked about how radical it is that everyone around the communion table is fed. In a world where so many people don't have enough to eat, including right here in our very own neighborhood, Sharing in communion is like the church's way of defiantly saying back to the world, God's intention is that there is enough for everybody. With the support of my bishop, I eventually asked Amy if she thought she could feel her way into full participation in worship, including receiving communion, not necessarily as a declaration of faith in any doctrine, but as a spiritual practice that she would commit to for her full year of service. 
She reflected for a long time before saying yes, she thought she could make that commitment. It was a pretty powerful experience for both of us to lock eyes as Amy received communion for the first time. This is the body of Christ given for you, I said as I placed the bread in her open hands, getting a little bit choked up as another member of that community placed a hand on Amy's shoulder as she received the body of Christ. At the end of her year of service, Amy wrote me a long letter. She expressed her gratitude that the church would take a chance on her and about how powerful it was to be welcomed into a community of faith, even if she still had as many doubts and questions as she did when she started. But one of those questions is new, she wrote. After a whole year of taking communion with these people that I have come to love, suddenly one of my questions is, what if it's true? The sixth chapter of John begins with one of the Bible's greatest hits, the feeding of the 5,000. With just a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread, Jesus satisfies the deepest hungers of a huge crowd of food insecure people. The generous power of Jesus completely captivates that crowd and they begin to follow him all over the place. But rather than keep on with delicious handouts of bread, served up alongside easily digestible messages of love and blessing, Jesus starts talking about himself as the bread of life, which is confusing at best to this crowd of would-be disciples. And it only gets stranger from there. By the time we get to the end of chapter six, which we read this morning, Jesus is launching full on into this long convoluted teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which I'm sorry, if we turn off our churchy ears for a little bit of time here, we hear just how kind of weird and gross that sounds. The disciples are right. This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? A strong part of the evangelist in me wants to defend Jesus to you all, to explain away his shocking language and package up his message in terms that are a little less offensive, a little more palatable. I want to remind you about how important the incarnation is for the gospel of John, how much it matters that God took on flesh and blood and became one of us, and how Jesus is reminding, of that, uh, reminding us of that here. I want to tell you about how in Hebrew, the, the expression flesh and blood means the whole person. It's sort of like our expression, body and soul. So though Jesus' language about flesh and blood sounds pretty intense, it's just his way of saying that we need to receive all of him in order to really live. I want to remind you of all the ways that John's gospel expresses the intimate relationship between Jesus and those who trust him. He is the vine. We are the branches. He is the shepherd. We are the sheep. He abides in God and we abide in him. This stuff about flesh and blood is just one more expression of the kind of intimacy that Jesus wants to have with us. All of those explanations are theologically and biblically accurate. But what if good theology and sensible explanations aren't really the point here. What if this difficult teaching isn't something that we need to intellectualize and figure out so that we can explain it to ourselves and to other would-be disciples? Instead, what if this text from the sixth chapter of, God, of John is an invitation to our post-enlightenment, science-minded brains to follow the trail of breadcrumbs deeper and deeper into the mystery of Jesus' presence in our lives and in the life of the world? What if we take Jesus at his word, that when we gather around the communion table, even in this imperfect, distant, online, COVID-safe kind of way, we're not just eating some crispy little approximation of bread, and swallowing a sip of wine or of grape juice, but that we are taking the freeing, life-giving presence of Jesus into our very bodies until it literally clings to our bones and courses through our veins. 
What if this simple meal is enough to receive the incarnation so fully into our lives that we begin to exude the flavor of Christ to an aching, hurting world? What if this communion with Jesus is so tangible and penetrating that his mercy and forgiveness and healing become as much an actual part of our actual bodies as last Tuesday's breakfast? This teaching might be hard, but it also makes my soul sing with hope in an echo of Amy's question. What if it's true? I mentioned a second ago that it's the evangelist in me that wants to defend Jesus to you all, that wants to explain away his weird imagery and his shocking language. But after a week of wrestling with this hard teaching, turns out I'm the one who got evangelized. This last Friday evening, Pastor Ben, Miss Rebecca, and I gathered on the Catherine Lawn for a First Communion retreat with 18 third graders and the grown-ups who love them. We splashed each other with water as we remembered our baptisms. We made banners with our names and decorated candles that remind us that we are the light of the world. We did a reader's theater rendition of the Last Supper, which included washing each other's feet, just like Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And we got wide-eyed together and how God uses the simplest, most ordinary things, water and bread and wine, stuff that we can touch, the stuff of daily life to fill us with God's incredible promises of love and abundant life. Watching these kiddos lean so fully into the mystery and truth and joy of God's unfailing goodness was a gift beyond all measure. Please keep them close to your hearts as they gather again on the Catherine Lawn this next Friday and Saturday evening. We're surrounded by the love of this whole community of faith. They will reach out their hands for the first time and hear the words, this is the body of Christ given for you. As they receive the very presence of Christ into their own little bodies, may their gentle faith and simple wisdom inspire the confession of us grown-ups too, even in the face of a hard teaching. We have come to believe and know that you, Jesus, are the Holy One of God. Amen.